every year, or every third year rather, in our liturgical cycle, we have cycle A, cycle B, cycle C. We tend to feature one of the uh, synoptic gospel writers, either Matthew in year A or Mark in year B, which is the year we're currently in. And then in year C, we feature Luke. We get John primarily in Lent and Easter. But every year B, we always take a time out from our readings from the Gospel of Mark, and we shift our attention to the Gospel of John. It's always right here in the middle of the summer. Um, it's always John 6. From a liturgical point of view, that should catch our attention. Right? We've been journeying through John, or rather Mark, and now suddenly we're switching for almost a month to John 6. Um, the church is trying to draw our attention to something really important here. Specifically, the most significant element of our lives as Christians, which is the Holy Eucharist. And so we'll spend the next month here in John 6. And it's worth noting that in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get what's called an institution narrative, right? So we get the story of the Last Supper, Jesus calling the disciples together, breaking bread, blessing the wine, and it becomes the body and blood of Christ, we know. And um, in John's gospel, however, there's, there's no institution narrative. And a lot of scriptures scholars ponder why, and part of the reason is we, we get this great section on the Eucharist in John 6. We hear the all too familiar story of the feeding of the multitudes. It's 5,000 in some gospels, it's 4,000 in other. Uh, perhaps the story itself becomes so familiar to us and so it can lose its significance over time, but this story must have really impressed the early church. The multiplication of the loaves. Because it appears not just in the synoptic gospels, but in every single gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so considering that we as a church are going to spend about a month or so here in John 6, I think it's worth it to dig into this passage that we heard today and the ones that we'll hear in the next few weeks. John, one of his sort of characteristics is that he gives lots of details. And at our first read, we can sometimes just kind of glance over them and not think much of them. But John, as a good rule of thumb, is to pay attention to those details. So, for example, he tells us that Jesus goes up on a mountain. Mountains, especially in the Old Testament, are evocative. They're places where people go to be close to God, right? Significant things happen on mountains. Moses goes and meets God face to face. He receives the law. Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and Luke. Where? On a mountain. Mountains always seem to represent the place where heaven and earth meet. Isn't that exactly what we believe about the Holy Eucharist? It's the place where we, the church on earth, get to meet the heavenly Christ in the Eucharist. The bread and the wine, the ordinary elements are transformed, we believe, into the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus. One of the other details John tells us in this gospel is that the Passover is near. And when we hear this, our, our ears should perk up a bit. Recall that in John's gospel, Jesus is sacrificed on the cross at the same time when all of Israel are sacrificing their Passover lambs. Jesus is the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. We say that every week, every day, when we come to receive the Holy Eucharist. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Grant us peace. From the very beginning, the Eucharist has been associated with that wonderful sacrifice of Christ. We enter into the Paschal mystery, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Whenever we come and gather around this altar and receive the Holy Eucharist, 
And a lot of your friends from other Christian denominations like to claim that we re-sacrifice Christ on the altar. That's not what's happening. What's happening is we represent that sacrifice that was one for us at one time. And it's made present again. Turning back to this story, we see that Jesus, he witnesses the crowd. He, out, he looks out and sees these multitudes of people. He sees that they're hungry, they're tired, they're isolated, they're burdened. And what does he do? He takes two fish and five loaves and he multiplies them to feed thousands. He gives the people what they need for their journey. They come to him looking for sustenance and Jesus provides. In the same way, brothers and sisters, Jesus provides sustenance for us in the Holy Eucharist. We come to this altar week after week, day after day, and Jesus provides us his very self as food and drink for the journeys of our lives. The sustenance, yeah, he feeds us physically. We receive food that we eat, but he also feeds us spiritually. He sustains our souls. Without this food, we cannot, cannot make it through the spiritual life. So Jesus, after having this dialogue with the apostles, instructs all of the people to sit down. And then he feeds them together. Together. I think sometimes as Catholics, we can focus so much on our own individual reception of the Eucharist, which is important. Don't get me wrong. Jesus encounters us person to person in the Holy Eucharist. But we do that in the context of this community. Right? Jesus desires to meet each of us, but... The reception is in the context of communion. If you think about it, that phrase, receiving communion, it's kind, of, it's kind of odd, actually. But it's true. When you and I eat Jesus in the Eucharist, we are conformed to him. We are made the body of Christ by consuming the body of Christ. The Eucharist isn't just a, a symbol of our unity. It is the bearer of that unity. It brings it about. And finally, John gives us this detail. He tells the apostles, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. And so they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. Why does John include that detail? Well, if you're a close reader of his gospel, you'll know that all of the miracles that Jesus does in John's gospel, whether it be the wedding feast at Cana, right, or um, speaking to the woman at the well, or, or raising Lazarus, whatever it might be, all of those miracles are super abundant. They provide far more than is ever needed. The point is, when God's grace manifests itself, he not only provides for our immediate needs, he provides for that need and then some. Way more than we could ever need. St. Thomas Aquinas, our patron, he says, goodness desires to diffuse itself, to spread itself. And God, who is supremely good, supremely diffuses himself. He feeds us here, but then he desires us to go out. To, bestower, to be bestowers of that grace that we've received for others. There's a super abundance. It's not just providing for us, it's providing for other people. Witnessing to our faith. Jesus remains with us after the Mass. You can come here to St. Tom's. Thanks be to God, we're back open 24 hours a day, and you can visit the Blessed Sacrament. When the student parishioners return, we will have adoration here on this altar, exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, most days of the week. 
Jesus remains with us. Jesus desires to feed us, to nourish us, to comfort us in the Holy Eucharist. It's his way of being present with us. I will be with you until the end of the ages, he says. Why are we spending five whole weeks in John chapter 6? Because all of that detail that we got from this small passage, we are going to get over and over and over for the next couple of weeks. So my challenge for you is to read John chapter 6 over the next few weeks. Spend some time with it. Pray with it. Allow Jesus to deepen your own appreciation of the Holy Eucharist that we celebrate. It's the, the source and the summit of our faith. That's what our catechism says. So as we come forward to receive Jesus here at this Mass under the form of bread and wine, may each of us receive the food, the sustenance that we need for our journeys and so that we can be food for others out in the world.